My name is Andreas Eret. I'm a part of Dolby. Uh, my role within Dolby, I'm the director of automotive. That means I'm setting our automotive business strategy and then responsible for our global automotive business. So the history of Dolby Atmos is that we first brought it to the cinema back in 2012. And since then, we have brought it to so many more places. That means from the cinema, we brought it to home theater, we expanded it to other content forms like episodic content, TV series, or live sports. We also applied it to other use cases that go beyond the screen or without actually having a screen. That means we've used it for music. We always knew that music and stereo is not the end of a great experience. So we invented also uh, how to apply Dolby Atmos for music. Nowadays, it's also used uh, in other places, for example, like gaming. Uh, you can also do gaming in Dolby Atmos. Uh, we're also thinking about other places as well. So Dolby Atmos is an audio format that offers an immersive audio experience. If you consider an audio experience that you know today, stereo, you're essentially bound to two channels and two speakers in front of you. With Dolby Atmos, we're putting the listener right in the front or in the center of the action. So to understand what the Dolby Atmos experience really means, it's also useful to think about how is that experience actually created. If you compare that to stereo, you only have two speakers, two channels. So the entire song had to fit into that space between the left and the right channel. With Dolby Atmos, we're using the entire space. That means surrounding you as the listener, including overhead. The music creative can put each instrument exactly in the position they would like to do, um, and that would creating really a Dolby Atmos experience. So we're looking at designing specific playback algorithms so sounds can come from any direction, but they can also be placed uh, far away or close to you. And that is a combination of placing the sound in the three-dimensional space, but then also you could consider room effects. Uh, if a sound that's close to you may does not have so much room, but the sound that comes from far away has more room. So it's a combination in the creative process for precise placement and overlaying sound. So if you want to place a audio object and moving from far to near, uh, of course it starts again with the spatial placement of where you want to, to place that object. And in addition, if you think about Atmos as a technology that has a lot of data around the room to understand where places, where, where sounds are located, the way it works, we're using uh, what you would call a filter bank. So you're dividing the space around you into uh, a, a fine-grained uh, pieces of like the sound frequency tiles and the spatial tiles. That means we're using another representation of the audio signal uh, by means of transforming it by mathematical equations of filter banks. Um, filter banks that are optimized to segment the signal into time frequency domain tiles and then also understanding where are those locations from and then understanding and we're applying an understanding of how much degrees of accuracy do we actually need uh, and, and we're always measure against the human ear. Um, with that uh, we're just making sure there's actually a lot of science behind it on one hand but there's also a lot of actually testing behind it. So all the algorithms that we're designing in order to achieve the compression, we are also making sure that we're using a lot of testing in our labs to make sure there, there's no psychological or, or physical difference uh, when you listen to those files. So what we call that, uh, we're always looking for transparency. So in order to uh, deliver all that experience to the listener, um, as explained, you have to start in the studio, but let's say we're given that experience and the creation as from the studio. The trick now is how can I translate that to the playback environment in the home, on the go, on a headphone or in a car. 
And that's actually where the magic happens. So you first have to be able to deliver that in a bandwidth efficient manner because you're delivering a digital signal with lots of information. And then the experience as created in the studio has to be played back across all those devices in a consistent manner. So if you consider a car environment as opposed to, let's say, a cinema or a living room, there's a bunch of additional challenges that you have to overcome and, and to account for. For one, if you consider, for example, the cabin size, the cabin size of a car is much smaller than a natural room. Uh, and that is, that is posing challenges, uh, for example, especially for bass reproduction. Um, it, another challenge is that the speakers in the car may not always be in an optimal position. So you have to account for all the different positions of those speakers in the cars. And sometimes also you have to think about, oh, there's a tweeter and there's a mid-range speaker and they're not in the best position or in the same position. If you think about where are listeners positioned in the car, they're actually all of axes. If you think about a stereo setup or, or a living room setup, you know where the sweet spot is, which is in the middle between all the speakers. Uh, in a car environment, uh, you're, all passengers are of center. So also you also have to uh, consider uh, that special kind of seating. On the flip side, actually knowing where people sit is a huge advantage. Um, if you think about uh, rendering uh, via all the speakers in the cars, uh, you have a huge, huge advantage because people don't move. Uh, in a, as opposed to a home theater environment, people are off the couch, off the sweet spot all the time. However, in a car, they have a fixed seating position and I also know exactly where the speakers are. So I can do a lot with the so-called cabin tuning to make sure that I can optimize the sound uh, for all the listeners uh, taking into account knowledge about where the speakers are. So the first step uh, in the car cabin tuning process is that you measure uh, the frequency responses uh, of all the speakers in the car cabin at the different seating positions. Um, and when you have that, you have an acoustic fingerprint of the car, and then you start to optimize uh, the basic cues, delay adjustment, what have you. That process has actually been, been done in collaboration between new sound engineers, Dirac sound engineers, and our field engineers that um, from the basic car cabin tuning, also the Dolby Atmos experience actually works. The difference between the basic tuning and Atmos means that you also want to make sure that the spatial impression, uh, the immersiveness in, let's say, the front stage and the rear stage, all that balance is smooth uh, and works out. So for example, if the creative pans around an object, around the listener, that all of that is in a smooth pattern. There's no jumps, there's no glitches, there's no level jumps or anything. Um, and all of that is part of that process to ensure that the experience lives up to, up to our expectations. We're spending a lot of time in the car and spending time in the car to actually enjoy yourself uh, and in, as you do in the living room makes perfect sense. So to make the ride as comfortable and enjoyable as possible, yeah, that's just, that's just a given aspiration. Uh, be very much like. Now, also it matches well with the car industry trends. So with, yeah, vehicles without uh, motor noise uh, that allows for a quieter journey. And what we as Dolby can bring to the living room or to the living room on wheels is, yeah, that we can enhance entertainment like we have done in all those other places, like the living room, the real living room. That means your audio experience, your cinema experience, your music experience will just get better uh, and you will get a much better emotional experience through that entertainment um, experience.